tragic case of uh, Savita Halapanabar could unfortunately happen again, even after this legislation is passed. And uh, what the Savita Halapanabar case did was to demonstrate in a way readily understood the, the kind of risk that a pregnant pregnant woman can be exposed to even in very limited circumstances um, and I think that that was readily understood and I think a lot of people were very scared as a consequence of that case. We were forced to, uh, we are asking people also or expecting people also to demonstrate or to abandon their anonymity like her family did, like the like of Deirdre Conroy did, so as people can understand and so as that, that understanding can help us to make laws. Deirdre Con Conroy went through four years of legal wrangle in the European Court um, um, and essentially it was an issue that could have been considered by our courts. It's inexcusable in my opinion, in my opinion not to include the heartbreaking issue of fatal fetal, fetal abnormalities. I know there are TDs on the government side who also believe this. To force a woman to continue with a pregnancy to term when there is no prospect of giving birth uh, to a baby that is uh, compatible, compatible with life is barbarous. For most women and couples who find themselves in this unfortunate situation, it will have followed the great joy of uh, being told that, the, 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 a positive, um, uh, that there was a pregnancy, that they, were, that they could look forward with great hope to a life and they are mostly looking forward to a live, healthy baby. They will have considered names, they will have shared the news with their family and friends. They'll be asked if they've had their scan, is it a boy, is it a girl, all of that. And they'll be looking forward in great hope. And then they'll get the devastating news that, they're the pregnant, that there will be a pregnancy, but there will be no baby at the end of it. To force any woman, woman to continue with that pregnancy to almost full term is horrific. And I just don't think that the, I think there's a, a compassion in Irish people that, that find that unacceptable. Um, and I don't believe that Irish people would want to put a woman through that or a couple through that because they're very often it, it is deeply felt by both, both and mostly it is. Instead of there being a duty of care to the woman, and that's where the focus should be at that point, we force so many of them to seek that compassion and that care in hospitals in Liverpool or Manchester or London. And I believe that that's shameful. Pregnancy may be a natural occurrence, but it's not without risk. And only yesterday I met a young woman who was so damaged by such a pregnancy that she cannot physically have a baby uh, in the future and uh, will have lifelong adverse health effects as a consequence. Um, I also met a GP yesterday who talked of his daughter Ruth's experience. Her baby was diagnosed with fatal anacapoly at 13 weeks. She travelled to England for a termination. He said, if she had, had continued with the pregnancy, she would have effectively been a life support machine. He said, every day in hospitals, doctors and families have to make decisions to switch off machines. He asked, is this not a similar position? And I asked that today on his and on Ruth's behalf. I understand that neither rape nor incest can be included in this legislation because it would not be constitutional. That would require for a further referendum, which I believe we should commit to, um, and I would support. For those unfortunate enough who have experienced incest or rape, and those, and you know, often you meet, uh, well, you occasionally meet, I suppose, rather than often meet, people who have found themselves in that position, either recently or in the past. Um, often people who have experienced incest will talk about, you know, their guilt still, even though they were only children. And the only role that people like myself find themselves in is trying to encourage them to go for counselling. In the case of rape, so many of those crimes go unreported, often because they have no expectation that the courts will dispense justice or they want to remain anonymous and be sure that they can. Instead, they seek the support from organisations like the Rape Crisis Centre. In many cases, it takes great courage to walk up that street, up those steps and in through that door. Um, on many occasions, uh, women uh, feel that they themselves have been put on trial often when it's gone to court. Um, and they know that the Rape, rape Crisis Centre will deal with them in a co confidential, co compassionate and sensitive way. This, this morning, some women or women may well visit the Rape Crisis Centre. 
And the rape may well have been very recent, and in any case, whether it's recent or it's historical, it's taken great courage for them to get there. And this morning, disgracefully, disgracefully, um, a van belonging to the pro-life movement pulled up outside the door of the rape crisis centre in Leeson Street. The photograph is there, there is no traffic around it, it's there, sitting outside. The abortion will, bill won't make women safer. That confidentiality that women looked for and looked for in going to there was breached this morning by that. It, you know, and I just find it completely unacceptable that that should have happened. It screams at them that women will be safer if this bill is not passed. It, it interferes in that, in that confidentiality that she, they thought that they were going to have in making that, the, uh, making that visit to the rape crisis centre. And it shows the lengths that this organisation will go to. And they're now trying to dismiss it and say, oh, they got stuck in traffic. And there, the photograph shows there's not, there's not a car or a bike or a bus anywhere near it. It was deliberate, it's disgraceful. These women were violated with the rape. They often feel viol violated by the very fact that they can't get justice. And now they're being violated again today by this kind of thing. And it is absolutely outrageous. Um, thank you. I believe this legislation is the bare minimum. Indeed, I believe there are, as I say, there are, I think there's members of the government side. Indeed, some of the comments when Claire Daly uh, uh, put forward her bill, uh, some of the, uh, the, the deputies on the government side, indeed your own party, uh, made speeches saying that they, uh, they, they were going to wait for this legislation. And the impression I think they had, and I think in good faith had, was this legislation was going to be maybe a little bit um, beyond what is presented. I accept that there is a. I accept that there is a limit on what can happen because of the uh, because of the Eighth Amendment, which I would favour removing. Um, but um, but I you know I just feel that it doesn't go far enough. I question whether or not it will meet the uh, meet uh, you know kind of the needs in relation to the uh, the European Court. Uh, and I think we could be back here sooner than we, we, we think we might be. And I would, you know, um, I would hope that we would take, instead of being instructed to do things from outside, I would hope that we would grow up and start recognising that Irish people have moved on from this. They, are, they trust women in, in this country can be trusted. Uh, you know, and you know, and that's something I think that should come across in this discussion. Um, and um, I think we should take uh, the responsibility to say this is what we need to do in a modern country that should have a duty of care uh, to the woman, um, uh, you know, particularly when they find themselves in situations like uh, rape or incest or the fetal, fatal abnorm abnormalities. And I just feel that from that point of view, what is put forward, although I would for, I, would, I would very much say that it is an improvement. Um, I just don't believe that it goes far enough. Thank you. Cormac, with Deputy Murphy, Speaker's Deputy Michael McNamara. Um, I believe 10 minutes. Thank you, Chair. Let you know when there's two minutes left. Yeah, I wish to, um, to agree with much of what uh, Deputy Murphy said, including especially the condemnation of the, the antics of um, the group which parked a van outside the, the Rape Crisis Centre. Um, Chairman, it is a tragedy when an expectant mother forms the belief that she cannot carry a pregnancy through to fruition to give birth to a life. The right to life is the most basic of human rights that this and every other state must vindicate. Equally, only a state with a blatant disregard for human rights, such as some kind of a warped theocracy, would seek to hold expectant mothers as prisoners of their pregnancy. The fact that for 20 years since the ex-case judgment, this legislature has refused to address the reality that thousands of Irish women have decided to terminate their pregnancies and travel to the UK and other jurisdictions to have, um, to have this procedure and continue to do so to this day is an indictment of this House and our entire body politic. 83 women who received abortions in England and Wales in 2011 gave home addresses in County Clare. It's reasonable to assume many women from Clare did not give their addresses and many others received abortions in jurisdictions other than England and Wales. In the first of three referenda on this issue in 1983, 
Article 40.3.3 of the Irish Constitution was inserted by the Eighth Amendment. This reads, the state acknowledges the right to life of the unborn and, with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother, guarantees in its laws to respect and, as far as practicable, by its laws to, to defend and vindicate that right. Subsequent referenda established the right to travel for the purposes of a termination and the right to receive information about such services abroad. And crucially for the purpose of this legislation, rejected a bill which removed as a grounds for the termination of pregnancy a real and substantial risk to the life of the mother by self-destruction. Such had been the finding of the Supreme Court in the X case. In that case, Mr Justice McCarthy noted that the right to life of the girl here is a right to a life in being. The right of the unborn is to a life contingent, contingent on survival in the womb until successful delivery. And he concluded, on the facts of the case, which are not in contest, I am wholly satisfied that the, a real and substantial risk that the girl might take her own life was established, and it follows that she should not be prevented from having a medical termination of pregnancy. Those are the parameters within which this House must now legislate. Both government parties agreed to examine the decision of the European Court of Human Rights in the ABNC case in advance, of the in, the sorry, in advance of the last election. Indeed, Ireland, like every other state which is a party to the Convention on Human Rights, undertakes to abide by the final judgment of the court in any case to which it is a party. In the ABNC case, it was affirmed that the court does not consider that the prohibition in Ireland of abortion for health and well-being reasons exceeds the margin of appreciation accorded in that respect to the Irish state. However, the court concluded that the Irish authorities had failed to respect the private life of the third applicant by reason of the absence of any implementing legislation or regulatory regime providing an accessible and effective procedure by which she could have established whether she qualified for a lawful abortion in Ireland in accordance with the Irish Constitution. In seeking to provide that clarity, Cian Corla, our chairman, I am concerned the protection of life during pregnancy bill, as it currently stands, may not adhere to our constitution. While section 6, 7 and 8 are read in conjunction with section 22, there appears to be no duty of care to preserve the life of the unborn as far as is practicable when carrying out necessary medical procedures in respect of a pregnant woman, and as a result the bill may be found to be unconstitutional. I am aware that in carrying out a medical procedure referred to in section 7, 8 or 9, a reasonable opinion must be formed, and that opinion must be formed having regard to the need to preserve human life as far as, as is practicable, um, that the risk to the life of the mother can only be averted by carrying out the medical procedure. However, while carrying out that medical procedure, it would appear that the bill as it is currently drafted um, would permit the intentional killing of the fetus, even if it might otherwise survive the procedure. I don't believe that to be the intention of the bill, but I also don't believe that it would be constitutional to legislate in that manner, and I look forward to clarification from the Minister on this crucial matter before this bill passes through uh, these houses. The last thing we need, 21 years after the X case, is for this bill to be referred to the Supreme Court and found to be unconstitutional. And it is a virtual certainty that this, the constitutionality of this bill will be tested, either through a reference from the President or otherwise. The second matter which I wish to raise is the Taoiseach's suggestion to the Dáil that it is not permissible under the Constitution um, to include in this legislation a provision for abortion in cases of fatal fetal abnormality. However, in the case of Dee versus Ireland, another European Court of Human Rights case, decided in two, June 2006, the Government of Ireland presented a very different story to the Court. In that case, Dee, the mother of two children, became pregnant with twins. She was informed by her obstetrician that one fetus had stopped developing at eight weeks gestation. In the 17th week of pregnancy, it was confirmed that the second fetus, fetus had a lethal genetic condition. She felt unable to tolerate the physical and mental toll of a further five months of pregnancy with one fetus dead and the other dying. She did not consider any legal proceedings in Ireland at that point, but rather made arrangements to travel to the UK for an abortion which she underwent. She chose the medical induction option, leading to 24 hours labour, as she felt it was the option most respectful of the second fetus. She felt that there was a culture of concern in this hospital which she found reassuring. 
She did not have time to remain in the UK to have counselling and the genetic implications for future pregnancies, although she was given some statistical information about the recurrence of this abnormality. She transported the foetus to Ireland for a discreet burial by a sympathetic minister. In the government's submission to the court, it stated that the foetus was viable in the X case, whereas in the present case, there might be an issue as, the, as to the extent to which the state was required to guarantee the right to life of a foetus which suffered from a lethal genetic abnormality. The meaning of unborn in Article 40.3.3 had attracted some public and academic comment. Um, however, there had been little judicial examination of the meaning unborn and certainly no case comparable to the present. Accordingly, although it was true that Article 40.3.3 had to be understood as excluding a liberal abortion regime, the courts were nonetheless likely to interpret the provision with remorseless logic, particularly when the facts were exceptional. It, uh, if, therefore, it had been established that there was no realistic prospect of the fetus being born alive, then there was at least a tenable argument which could be seriously considered by the domestic courts to the effect that the foetus was not an unborn for the purposes of Article 40.3.3, or that even if it was an unborn, its right to life was not actually engaged as it had no prospect of life outside the womb. In the absence of a domestic decision, it was impossible to foresee that Article 40.3.3 clearly excluded an abortion in the applicant's situation in Ireland. So that was the government's submissions at the time. On the basis of these submissions, the court found that if the question of whether 40.3.3 excluded an abortion in the case of fatal fetal abnormality was novel, it was nevertheless an arguable one with sufficient chances of success to allow the initial burden on the government to be considered satisfied. And accordingly, the European Court found that a legal constitutional remedy was in principle available to the applicant in Ireland to obtain declaratory and mandatory orders with a view to obtaining a lawful abortion in Ireland. Well, that obviously begs the question, was the government wrong in what it told the European Court of Human Rights on the 6th of September 2005? Or was the Taoiseach wrong in what he told the Dáil yesterday? Thank you very much, Chairman. Could I have a Deputy McNamara? Um, next speaker is Deputy Seamus Healy. Um, I believe you're sharing your 20 minutes with Deputy Adams. I'll let you know whenever there's two minutes of your 10 uh, minutes. Thank you, Cahirlach. Uh, Cahirlach, uh, I want to say, first of all, that I welcome and support this uh, legislation. Uh, it is uh, limited and restrictive uh, legislation indeed. Uh, and it is true to say that it's a sensitive issue. And it's very difficult for, uh, for some people indeed for very many people and I suppose the expert report uh, put that quite well uh, when it said that um, abortion is a difficult painful issue in this country and elsewhere and it said the reasons are not hard to understand intense ethical religious social political and intimate personal issues coincide of course that is quite 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 correct um, it has to be dealt with, obviously, in a, a compassionate and in a very understanding way. However, it does have to be dealt with, and it has to be dealt with urgently. Uh, we simply cannot uh, continue to have a situation where uh, women's lives are at risk or where uh, the medical profession are unclear about the legal position that they, they find themselves in. And, of course, we as legislators uh, at this stage, 21 years later, uh, must accept our responsibilities uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, in, my, in my view, uh, there is an overwhelming middle ground uh, a very significant majority of the public uh, who are in favour of this bill, in favour of the provisions within this bill. And indeed, that uh, overwhelming, medic um, overwhelming middle ground uh, would go much further indeed uh, and would include in, the, in, in this bill um, items like uh, fatal fetal abnormality, inevitable miscarriage, uh, pregnancy arising from rape uh, and, and incest. And I think... Um, uh, many uh, polls have shown uh, shown that in the in in the in the in the recent past and indeed in uh, uh, far, farther back, um, the 
the history of this, of course, goes way back to 1983 and to the, and to the referendum. Uh, the X case uh, in 1992 uh, and uh, the two referendums of 1992 and 2002 and indeed uh, the European Court case of ABCD versus, uh, versus Ireland in uh, 2010. Um, and it, it's uh, quite clear that the Supreme Court uh, found uh, that, um, that termination is lawful in Ireland where, as a matter of probability, a woman faces a real and substantial risk to her life, uh, and where that risk can only be averted by, by a termination. Uh, the late Justice Niall McCarthy said at the time uh, that, uh, uh, that the delay uh, that had ta taken place at that stage, uh, and remember, we're now 21 years further down the road, he said the delay was not just unfortunate, but it was now inexcusable. Uh, and of course it is inexcusable uh, now. Uh, we have obviously the uh, both court cases, but we also have the people have spoken on two occasions in relation to this uh, particular issue uh, in 1992 and in 2002, and, and they supported uh, the uh, contention that um, uh, suicide as a real and substantial risk uh, to the life of the mother uh, should, be, uh, should be included. Um, the, uh, so obviously it's now uh, necessary for, uh, for the uh, government and for the Oireachtas uh, to put in place uh, legislation uh, based on that case and indeed based on the uh, European uh, uh, court case. Um, there are a number of uh, issues um, in relation to the legislation which uh, I would like to just refer to. Um, First of all, the, uh, the, the indication from uh, some people that this is a very liberal piece of uh, legislation. I think we have to remember uh, that this legislation is governed uh, by uh, the Constitution, uh, the 1983 uh, amendment to the Constitution. It's governed by the uh, X case where, you, as I said, we speak about, uh, the court spoke about uh, where a woman's uh, life was at risk by a real and substantial risk to her life and where it could only be averted by, uh, by a termination. Um, there's also, uh, I think, uh, the, the statement by some people that, uh, you know, that, that this is a very liberal piece of, uh, of legislation and uh, referring to the situation in Britain is, in my view, at, at, best, uh, at be best misleading. Uh, yeah, the British legislation refers obviously to the health of the woman, whereas in, in the, this case we speak about the uh, a real and substantial risk to the life, uh, to the life of the woman. Um, there are uh, a number of issues in the legislation itself which I, I believe should be, uh, should be dealt with and uh, these have been referred to or some of them have been referred to. Um, in, in uh, other contributions, but uh, one I wanted to uh, come back to again is the whole question of uh, uh, fatal fetal abnormality and the, the group terminations for medical uh, reasons uh, have, uh, uh, have uh, put this issue uh, clearly on the agenda. They've spoken to us uh, by way of briefing in the AV room, etc. Uh, and this is a very sad and tragic situation which many families find themselves in, uh, almost 1,500 rather, uh, each year in Ireland. Uh, and these are real people, real stories of the injustice of having to travel to seek medical termination and treatment. Uh, so that, uh, 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 and for those families, uh, this uh, is a denial of treatment in Ireland uh, and having to go abroad for treatment, uh, they feel, is, is, very, uh, is, is very unfair and indeed unjust. And of course, um, the, the whole question arises in this uh, case uh, and um, a number of uh, eminent um, legal people have indicated that... Um, have indicated that uh, 
this uh, termination for uh, fatal fetal abnormality is indeed uh, constitutional and I think this is, uh, has been um, supported by the uh, D case and the government's uh, and the, the government's case made in Europe in relation to that. And if I just could uh, briefly uh, read from portion of that uh, portion of that um, uh, judgment. Uh, it, it says, accordingly, although it was true that Article 43.3 had to be understood as excluding a liberal abortion regime, the courts were nonetheless unlikely to interpret the provision with remorseless logic, particularly when the facts were exceptional. If, therefore, it had been established that there was no realistic prospect of the fetus being born alive, then there was at least a tenable argument which would be seriously considered by the domestic courts to the effect that the fetus was not an unborn for the purposes of Article 43.3, or that even if it was an unborn, its, its right to life was not actually engaged as it had no prospect of life outside the womb. In the absence of a domestic decision, it was impossible to foresee that Article 43.3 clearly excluded an abortion in the applicant situation in Ireland. So the, the Irish government uh, argued that this particular uh, case, case D, uh, could have been dealt with in the Irish courts and, uh, uh, and that uh, it was in fact, uh, con would in fact be constitutional in the Irish courts. And I think that has to be revisited in, the, in, this, in this legislation and uh, fatal fetal abnormality must, in my view, be covered in the legislation. Uh, another element of the legislation which I think needs to be addressed and uh, significantly addressed is the question of section uh, 22. Uh, and this is in respect of uh, uh, criminalising uh, uh, the, the, the pregnant uh, woman. Uh, and um, the, the uh, position here, uh, that there is legal precedent uh, whereby, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, w the pregnant woman affected uh, in a situation like this uh, would, uh, would be uh, excluded uh, from uh, from uh, c from committing an offence and therefore excluded from being um, uh, from being uh, uh, f from the provision which provides a 14-year uh, jail sentence. I think uh, the minister uh, will need. I think there's widespread, a widespread view that this is uh, is an unusual uh, is an unusual uh, um, uh, situation and that uh, that this should be uh, changed in the legislation. Uh, and um, I, I think there is a view, as I say, right across the uh, the um, right across the house, uh, that this is in in fact, uh, 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 you know, a, a provision uh, which should be changed uh, and uh, which should not be uh, contemplated uh, contemplated uh, further. Um, there is. Uh, uh, there are other items in the in the legislation. Uh, 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 which also uh, do need to be uh, do need to be addressed, uh, and I would suggest that um, the uh, time limits uh, in the legislation uh, would need uh, are, are certainly uh, uh, certainly need to be shortened uh, in in relation to uh, to um, to uh, reviews. Uh, there is no doubt, uh, in my view. Uh, that these could be and should be substantially shortened, and the uh, the number of days uh, should be reduced uh, from I think it's uh, three to one, uh, and uh, in the case of the seven day period, uh, reducing that uh, to uh, to three. Um, the uh, the the uh, other other. Um, uh, another item in the legislation, I think, which needs to be covered and which is not in the legislation currently is the whole question of duty of care uh, by uh, institutions uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, persons um, availing of this, uh, this, of this legislation. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, an another element, I think, that needs to be um, uh, that needs to be dealt with and included in this legislation, and again, which is not currently in the legislation, is the whole question of protecting women and doctors from, uh, from harassment. 
Uh, and uh, I'd just like to say, uh, finally, uh, that um, uh, in the number of these uh, cases, including uh, fatal fetal abnormality, the question of time limits, the question of duty of care, uh, the question of the protection of, uh, of uh, women and doctors uh, from harassment, uh, these are areas uh, where uh, I have lodged um, uh, amendments to the legislation and uh, obviously and hopefully the, these will be discussed uh, uh, at uh, committee stage uh, and uh, that we can come back with a piece of a, leg a piece of legislation uh, that is um, uh, that particularly cover covers uh, those areas and as I say uh, yeah, I welcome uh, finally I hear like I welcome the legislation uh, and support it and uh, you know again they say that it is lim it is quite limited and indeed restrictive uh, legislation.